Hello, everybody, and welcome to our Wednesday night Bible study. Today, we're going to start off uh, with the first chapter of James. We're going to go, uh, I think, at a slow pace through James. I've been trying to, um, you know, think through and pray through what uh, what book we were going to do with this Wednesday night Bible study. And since it's looking like we're going to be online for Wednesday night for uh, a little bit longer, for a lot longer than we anticipated, uh, we're going to start going through the book of James uh, rather slowly and uh, go through it week by week and section by section. Um, so I just invite you to, to open up your Bibles to, to James chapter 1 if you want to, and um, I would encourage you to uh, use this time to do some devotions out of the book of James. Uh, don't just wait for me to read it uh, and, and talk about what it means, but read it during the week. Uh, James is a rather short book. It's about five chapters, uh, and so... Um, you know, in each one of those chapters, it was about a page of, of the Bible. Uh, so if you want to read a chapter a day or just uh, uh, maybe a chapter a week, you know, section by section every day, and then, you know, we're going to come to these videos and talk about what it means and what and, and sort of wrestle with how we can put these things into action and interpret them uh, for our life in our faithful walk with God. Uh, but I do encourage you to just read those things on your own, at your own pace and in your own way, yes, but read them ahead of time. Um, and uh, I hope that um, journeying through James will be helpful to you. I think that James does a lot to help us understand um, how faith and action are united together and how uh, our actions feed into our faith, and our faith feed into how we live. Um, we talk in the church a lot about faith and a lot about works, um, but James does a good job at helping us to bring those two things together. Um, and so we're going to read through the book of James, and I hope that uh, this is a blessing to you, and I hope that you uh, take some time to read it for yourself. Don't just read the Bible um, through Austin. Read the Bible um, you know, on your own time, and then come into community with us and discuss with us. And, and I think you will be richer for it, having read ahead of time and engaged in these conversations and, and watch these videos, knowing what it says before I even talk about it. So if you, even if you want to pause and just read through um, the first eight verses of chapter one, um, and think about it and reflect on it, talk about it with your family um, before we discuss tonight. I encourage you to do so. But let's, uh, otherwise, let's just jump into it. The book of James is a letter. Um, much like most of the books of the New Testament are letters, James is a letter um, addressed to um, Christians abroad. Um, unlike some of the letters like Philippians, Ephesians, Galatians, uh, this is not a letter written to a specific uh, group of churches in a place, uh, but is addressed to the 12 tribes in dispersion. Uh, we, we ran into a little bit of this description in uh, 1 Peter of the tribes of Israel in the uh, diaspora, this dispersion, this scattering of the people of God abroad. Um, and that's a similar um, address that we have in the book of James. James is, um, that we presume, is the same James that is the brother of Jesus Christ. Um, and when I say brother of Jesus Christ, I mean like um, biological brother, uh, that like his mother Mary gave birth to James as well, um, not conceived by the Holy Spirit, uh, to be clear, um, but is a brother of Jesus. Um, you know, in the Gospels, uh, there's an instance where people come and they say to Jesus, your mother and your brothers are here. What they likely mean are your mother and your uh, your the rest of your family, your your biological brothers are here. 
Um, and Jesus says something to the effect of, my mother and brothers are those who um, hear the word and, and obey it. Um, and James opens up the letter, I think, affirming exactly that. Um, he opens up with a very strong statement about who he is. James, a slave of God. It says servant to uh, kind of null the effects of that word slave because for for us in america i think slavery means something differently than in bible times slavery though wrong in bible times uh didn't it wasn't uh reduced down to a one person owning another person as property which it is uh which that is what american or what uh slavery has been in american history uh, but rather, a uh, slave is one who is indentured to work for, um, who is um, who is in debt or uh, willingly under the uh, in servitude to another person, whether by a debt they owe or a, a job that they enter into. It is a, uh, to be sure, a binding thing um, where a slave was a. Um, while not property, very much tied to the household, tied to the person or the family uh, with whom they worked, um, and it was a it was a a uh, act of servitude. One who is a slave is beneath the one that they serve, um, and so that's what it means when James is saying that he is a slave of God. He has entered into this relationship with God and with the Lord Jesus Christ in which he is not their equal. He is not um, his own man, and he is not um, free to do whatever he wants to do. And in that sense, not in the we are property sense, but in the we are willingly and bindingly, serving the Lord and serving God, we are, in a sense, slaves of God and of Jesus Christ. When we enter into this relationship, this saving relationship with God, we are, uh, we serve the Lord. We are beneath the Lord. We are cared for and housed by, and um, all that we have comes from the Lord. We serve the Lord. And that's why I think that, um, you know, the Bible uses that analogy of, of people being slaves to sin, but now you are slaves to Jesus Christ. Uh, the, you know, one of the oldest stories in the Bible, the uh, Israelites were slaves of Pharaoh, but now they are, now they serve the Lord. They are under a new master, one who does not treat them like slaves, but treats them like family one who treats them with respect and with honor and with love. So James, when he says he is a slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, we should recognize that that's pretty significant for somebody that we understand to be the brother of Jesus. Because he could flaunt that. He could throw that out there of saying, listen to me because my authority comes from my proximity to Jesus. I am his brother. I grew up with him. I was around him. So my authority in saying these things to you, he could say, oh, that comes from how closely I have been to Jesus. No, uh, he doesn't say that. Rather, he says he addresses the people of God who are dispersed uh, and are in trouble and are in need of some good news and some instruction and some wisdom that he is a slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, that all that comes from here, all that is said from here, from verse 1 down, comes from a person who serves the Lord, not a person who lords it over the people he's writing to, but a person who serves the Lord. That's where our the authority of the church, the authority of Scripture comes from, not from our proximity to God, but from the authority of God at work, through the, through the witness of the Holy Spirit at work in the church. And that is something we are underneath. 
We are not free to say whatever we want to say as the church. James is not free to say whatever he wants to say. He says out of a relationship with God, a proper relationship, one in which he is the servant and God is the master and God is in charge. James, a slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes in the dispersion. Greetings. And then he begins to speak. And um, most of chapter one uh, and, and what we'll be focusing on these first two paragraphs here um, he's going to uh, say uh, uh, many, th many different things. And so we're going to slowly work through chapter one. And some of those things he will uh, then go and uh, talk, um, talk about in more detail later in, later in the letter. Uh, so, you know, these first sections of the letter, which is kind of common for b biblical letters. Uh, we talked about that with First Peter and with others. Um, it kind of gives you a glimpse of what you're going to be reading about. It kind of summarizes um, sometimes, sometimes not so much, but for the most part, you can tell in the first chapter what the major themes are going to be. What are the things that we're going to talk about? What are the things that we're going to try to drive home in detail or just in simple uh, words in this, in this letter? And James says, uh, my brothers and sisters, Whenever you face trials of many kinds or of any kind, consider it nothing but joy, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its full effect, so that you may be mature and complete, lacking in nothing. If any of you is lacking in wisdom, ask God, who gives to all generously and ungrudgingly, and it will be given to you. But ask in faith, never doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For the doubter, being double-minded and unstable in every way, must not expect to receive anything from the Lord. So we see in, in the first words in chapter, or in verse 2, sorry, um, just as James has has put up front his relationship with God. He is uh, not first and foremost this biological brother in relationship with Jesus. No, Jesus is his Lord. God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are, God, are James's Lord and Master and King. He serves them. Just as he talks up front about the relationship he has with God, with, with the Lord Jesus Christ. He also talks about his relationship with these churches, with these people, with these, um, um, from the description, fellow Jews, fellow Jews who, um, who are perhaps, um, you know, under his guidance, uh, who perhaps have come to Christ, who are in need of, um, direction in believing in, jo in the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, he starts with his relationship with them. They are his brothers and sisters. Again, should be significant. Jesus, James is the brother of Jesus, but for James, Jesus is first and foremost his Lord. It is the rest of the people who claim him as Lord that are now his brothers and sisters. Whenever you face trials of any kind, consider it nothing but joy. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. Let that endurance have its full effect, so that you may be mature and complete, lacking in nothing. And I got to tell you, when I read that today, um, it just struck me. It convicted me. It... Uh, it spoke to me about this present situation in which we find ourselves. Um, I don't know entirely, and we don't really know because we're reading this letter that wasn't addressed first to us, but now has come to us as it is included in all of Scripture. I don't know what these 12 tribes in dispersion were going through. I don't know what 
um, oppression, what uh, rejection, what persecution, what um, you know, economic or psychological or spiritual things they were uh, dealing with or political things or just everyday things at their jobs or in their families. I don't know what all they were dealing with. But I know that, that James just generally says, when you face trials of any kind, consider it nothing but joy. What? <laughs> what do you mean we, gotta, we, we consider it joy when we face trials? What in the world does that mean? Um, and I don't know about you, but I feel like we've been tra- facing trials in this year of every kind or of lots of different kinds of trials. And maybe you've been felt, feeling overwhelmed by that. Maybe you've been feeling saddened by that. Maybe you long for things to be different and long for things to be back to normal uh, like I do. Maybe you're saddened like I am. Maybe you are, are troubled uh, and, and deeply um, wrestling with the things that are going on in the world and the trials that you are facing. Um, But James says to us, consider it nothing but joy. And again, I want to remind us that when, when we talk about that, when the writers in the Bible talk about that, it's not a glorification of suffering. It's not James saying, All those things are from the Lord. We'll get into that also even later on in next week's lesson. James will go on to say, if you feel tempted, no no one should ever say, I'm the Lord is tempting me, as if the Lord is bringing these things on us. Uh, No, it's not that God is bringing about these trials of any kind. It's that God is working even in and through these trials of many kinds to um, to uh, build up in us endurance and faith and hope that is mature and complete and whole, lacking in nothing. Um, so we rejoice in that. We rejoice not in the fact that there is suffering, but the fact that there is a God who has given to us uh, a pathway to faith, a pathway to life, who has given us faith, hope, and love. Not halfway, not some of the time, not only when things are good or only when things are bad, but uh, faith, hope, and love that it can be full and rich and mature and complete, lacking in nothing. So what has convicted me about this passage and and what I want to pass along to you is uh, what um, I've discovered what I have been wrestling with is the impatience that comes along with these trials that we face. We want this to be over. We want to get on with things. We want to things to get back to normal. But because we know, James tells us, because we know that even when we go through hard things, our faith still grows stronger that it is almost even because of the hard things that life throws our way sometimes, that faith can even grow stronger in that. Let endurance have its full effect. Don't settle for it just just huddled. uh, Don't just huddle and wait for it to be over. Let the endurance have its full effect. Go through this whole thing. Go through this whole ordeal, enduring it all, allowing God's faith to be built in you and strengthened in you so that you can be mature and complete, lacking in nothing. Because if we just wait for the next moment, then the faith that can grow in this moment won't grow. The faith that can grow in this moment and in this time won't be strengthened and we won't endure if we don't endure it and allow God to strengthen us in the midst of it. So just because we long for things to get back to normal, just because we long to get 
to the other side of these things, whatever that other side of this looks like, doesn't mean we just stop and we wait for it to be over. We wait to get on with it, or we just uh, pretend like it's not a big deal and pretend like we don't need uh, to watch out for one another like we did a couple months ago um, in this, with the same uh, intensity and the same endurance and the, with the same care and love for each other as we have um, at the beginning of this. We, we need to let this endurance, let, this, let the work of God um, build up faithfulness in us for the whole time for, to let this endurance have its full effect. Because what James is talking about here is an endurance of faithfulness. He's not saying we have nothing but joy because of how much we can take, but we have nothing but joy because of how much our faithfulness can grow and how enduring and everlasting and strong the faithfulness of God is at work in us, even in times of trial. Let the endurance have its full effect so that God can make you mature and complete, lacking in nothing. James uses a different word here. He uses the word perfect so that you may be perfect, lacking in nothing. Uh, but I think that the, the explanation here, the, the words mature and complete, uh, hint, point us toward what a biblical view of perfection looks like. Perfection in the scriptures is not about mathematical perfection, where there are no mistakes, where there are no cracks, where there is nothing, uh, there is no part of the equation that is uh, typed in wrong but that um, the faithfulness that we have is mature and complete, lacking in nothing. And mature and complete faith is always growing and always enduring and always strengthening. That is what mature and complete faith look like, is a mature and complete faith that is constantly growing closer and closer to Christ. Does that make sense? I hope it does. I hope that that kind of hints a little more about what uh, what it means to be mature and complete, lacking in nothing. That doesn't mean we never make mistakes and we never uh, question anything and we never do anything uh, wrong and we never, in our facing of trials, have uh, times where we waver from the endurance that God is desiring our faith uh, the strength that our, our God desires for our faith, but that um, in that constant grow, growth of our faith, we find that faith is always sufficient and always growing in us and always more sufficient than any of our sin and any of our doubts and any of what is lacking in us of faithfulness. That's what mature and complete faith looks like. That's what sanctification is, is this complete trust and complete submission to the work of God, which is constantly growing and moving us closer and closer toward the likeness in Christ. And in Christ, we lack nothing. So you say, maybe you say, Austin, well, uh, what about the things that I feel like I lack? I, uh, if you're like me, uh, maybe you feel a little bit at a loss sometimes in days like these. You don't know what to do. You don't know how to live in Corona time. You don't know how to engage faithfully in a time when you can't come together in the ways that you were. You can't exercise your your life at church in the ways that it was. You can't, um, you know, live life as a family in the same way. You, there's lots of things going on in the world that we um, are aware of in ways that we have never been aware of before because of technology. There are um, misguided truths being shared around on social media. What do we do with all this? How do we wisely and faithfully 
endure the trials of many kind of of many kinds that we face here in 2020 and beyond. Well, James addresses that. The in the process of our faith being sanctified in maturity and completion, lacking in nothing, if we lack any wisdom, if we lack in it in the wisdom, ask God. What do, I, what do we mean by wisdom? Wisdom is this discernment of what to do with the information we have. Knowledge is having all this information. And boy, do we have a lot of information. We have more news and more things, and we know more about one another than maybe we want to. But uh, if any of you is lacking in the wisdom to know what what to do faithfully with that information and with the, the lives that we live day by day. Ask God. Why do we ask God? Because he is a God who gives to us generously and ungrudgingly, and it will be given to you. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. God gives wisdom when you ask. God gives, gives wisdom when God's people need wisdom, and God's people need wisdom right now. We need wisdom with what it means to be faithful when we've been cut off at work. We need wisdom with what it means to be faithful when so many of our brothers and sisters of color are being um, mistreated. We need wisdom to know what is true and right and noble and faithful and what is not. We need wisdom on what it means to be the church today. And God is the kind of God who gives generously. I don't know about you, but when it says generously, I just think about receiving things that I didn't ask for. Generosity is something that we get, gifts that we get that we didn't ask for and we didn't, we didn't expect that much of it. God gives more wisdom than we ask for. And he doesn't give it uh, grudgingly. He doesn't give it and say, ah, well, you didn't do well with this wisdom last time, did you? So maybe I won't give you as much wisdom this time. Maybe I won't answer, <laughs> I won't be there for you as much this time. We, uh, I need to build up a little bit more trust with you first. No, he gives ungrudgingly, not measuring this, uh, does this person deserve wisdom? Does this person deserve wisdom when they need it and they ask for it and they believe that I will give it? No, he gives generously, far more than we can ask for or imagine, and he gives ungrudgingly, without, uh, without holding back. And it will be given to you, James says. You can know and reassure, be reassured that this God who has all the wisdom will give you wisdom to know what it means to be faithful in today's world. Just ask. But ask in faith, James says, never doubting for the one who doubts is like the wave of a sea driven and tossed by the wind. For the doubter, being double-minded and unstable, unstable in every way, must not expect the, to receive anything from the Lord. Now, when I read this today, I wrestled with it because um, I affirm and want to affirm to you today that I think that the scriptures point us to uh, toward wrestling with our doubts and our uncertainties. Um, and I can tell you from personal experience that I have doubted. And God has with every single doubt that I have ever had about Jesus, about the resurrection, about faith, about the faithfulness of God, God has come back and given me reassurance and given me wisdom and given me a yes in Jesus. If I doubt Jesus, Every promise in God is yes in Jesus, and he gives that reassurance to me every step of the way. And I wrestled that with this for a little bit because James says, never doubting. 
And, uh, you know, I've heard some say, you know, well, if you ask God for something, but you doubt, then you won't get it. And I wrestle with that some. Um, but I think that we can't take this out of context and say that James is just talking about anything that we pray for and everything that we pray for. Because um, if we do that, then we say, well, if we didn't get what we asked for, then maybe we just didn't believe. And that's troublesome to me. That's not biblical. That's not how prayer works is um, we asked God. And because we, uh, because for a moment we were uncertain, that's, that's God just kind of left off, left off things. He gives ungrudgingly, James says. So I don't think that that's the way that James is talking about this. What I do think that James is saying is that with all of our uncertainties, with all our lacking of wisdom, if we go to God doubting, then how, how can we expect and anticipate that we will gain wisdom from that? Doubting, uh, when James talks about doubting, he's talking about uh, doubt in relationship with asking for God or God for wisdom specifically. And when he's, he doesn't specify what kind, what we're doubting, what to never doubt. Is it that we aren't supposed to doubt uh, that God uh, will give us wisdom? Or do we doubt the uh, validity of God's wisdom? That, well, we have doubts that when God gives us wisdom, that that wisdom is actually wise and that we're actually going to follow it. And I think that's what James is saying, though he's not specific. I think that he's saying that when we have these uncertainties, when we feel like we're lacking in our faithfulness and feel like we're lacking in um in, in the knowledge and the assurance of what to do faithfully in this world, that when we ask God, we need to ask God with the trust that he is the kind of God who gives generously and ungrudgingly and that it, we will receive it, that we will receive wisdom. Because if we go to God not believing, not believing that his promises or that his wisdom is valid and applicable to our lives, or doubting that God will give wisdom at all, then we don't stand on on a level ground. We um, we can expect that even if God gives wisdom, if we go with that attitude, that there's a possi there's a strong possibility we won't know that it's God's wisdom when it gets here, or we won't do anything with it because we're going with the attitude and with the with uh, or that, sorry, we are going to God with this lack of faith that God will give us wisdom. And when we do that, we can expect that things won't change, that we won't grow wiser, that our faith won't produce endurance if we go to God and we ask for God to meet us in this time, which in this time in which we feel so uncertain. If we go to God doubting that he's ever even going to answer and doubting that his, what his answers are are sufficient, then we can expect that things aren't going to change because we're expecting things not to change. And we're not going to receive anything that God gives. But on the other hand, the good news of this passage, and what James is really driving at, is that when we ask God, believing and trusting that God is the kind of God whose wisdom is worth receiving and whose wisdom will come when we ask, when we trust that, God gives it. And we will know when it gets here. And it will be more than what we can ask for or imagine. It will be with no strings attached, and it will come to us. So ask in faith, my friends, my brothers and sisters, with the certainty, with the faith, 
with the trust in God that he is wise and he will give us the wisdom that we crave and need from him in these times. And when we receive that, we will be able to face any trials whatsoever with the joy and the knowledge that God is with us and that God is in it with us and that God is equipping us to be faithful and whole and complete and mature and giving us all that we need so that we don't lack anything, that this God is trustworthy enough and trustworthy um, to give us wisdom far beyond what we could ever ask for or imagine. This is a God who, when we ask and believe that he will give us wisdom to face all the things in which that we are uncertain of in these days, God will equip us to be faithful. So I ask us, what trials are you facing? in trials of any kinds. Rejoice, for God is with you. And God is growing in you a faith that does not waver in times of trial and does not uh, perish in times of hardship because God is enduring and God is everlasting and God is in you and working in you by faith to produce in you holiness so that you might look like the Lord Jesus Christ reflected in the world. And that whatever is lacking in us in these uncertain days, in our wisdom to do faithfully, God will give us wisdom. So ask him for it. God, we thank you that you are trustworthy and true. We thank you that even in our uncertainties, when we bring them to you and we anticipate and believe that you're going to meet our doubts with faith and you're going to meet our uncertainties with truth and you're going to meet our, our faithlessness with faithful instruction and with correction and with repentance and with grace, we trust that you're going to give us what we need in these days, the wisdom to be faithful. Help us to have the faith to ask you for wisdom. Help us, Lord, to go to you and to receive this wisdom. And help us, Lord, to put this wisdom into action in these days where we need you and we need to be faithful in all ways. And it is in your heavenly name that I pray. Amen. Go in his grace and peace today, and we'll see you Sunday, and we'll see you next week. God bless you.